you, thank you for the invitation. I'm, I'm delighted to be here, and thank you all for, for coming. Um, this is the second talk I've given this week in Oxford. I gave one last night uh, at St Anthony's on uh, my current research project, which is really about Taiwan soft power uh, and public diplomacy. <coughs> um, I'm currently writing a book about uh, Taiwan's international communications and its outreach. Um, and I thought that it might be a good idea to tonight switch to the other China um, and talk a little bit about Chinese soft power. Um, this isn't part of a, a bigger research project. It's not something that I'm working on in terms of books or, or papers. But I thought it, it's a good idea just to give you some of my thoughts and, and see, see, have, see how you react to it, see how you bounce uh, the ideas around that I'm going to present to you uh, today. Um, as, as, uh, as has already been said, I mean, I am, I am in international communications. I have a background in politics and then moved into international communications because of a, an obsession when I was young with, with shortwave radio, uh, listening to, to China Radio International uh, on shortwave radio at 3 o'clock in the morning to, 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 to minimize the crackling, which was always my passion. Um, you know, it's far too easy on the internet now. You know, all the, romantic, the romantic listening to shortwave radio has gone onto the internet. Um, and I moved into looking at, at, at Asia uh, in the 1990s when I, when I started going to, to Taiwan and China and thought that you know, a lot of what is happening in Asia represents very good case studies for, for more general trends in international communications and, and some very exciting developments are taking place in Asia. So I've worked on democracy and the media uh, in Taiwan and in China. I've worked on Radio Free Asia, uh, which, which was a very exciting project and taught me a lot about China. Um, the first time I, I went to China to teach at the University of Nottingham in Ningbo, uh, my wife and I were both some of the founders of that university. Um, the students asked me what I was working on, and I said, um, oh, I'm working on a radio station called Radio Free Asia. You've probably never heard of it, you're not allowed to listen to it. And they all said, yeah, we listen all the time, because we listen on the internet, and we know how to get around the proxy, you know, we use the proxy servers, and we can get around the firewall, and everything else. And this was a, a real eye-opener to me because you know, I, I just assumed that, that the government was all controlling, of course. And so actually being in China and talking to people who were actually on the receiving end of this communication was, was a great uh, eye-opener in, in many ways for my work. So my final apology that I just want to make is, is to those of you who attended my talk last night. Uh, a little bit will be repeated just to set the context about soft power and my position within it. So, so apologies, but please bear with me for those people who, who didn't... Um, have the pleasure or the pain of, of, of hearing my, uh, my, my, my talk last night. Um, okay, so I'm interested in the concept of, of soft power. Um, as I'm sure you are all aware, Joseph Nye is credited as the godfather of soft power. Um, he invented it, we are told. Of course, he didn't. Um, Although, you know, many people do, do, do say that Joseph Nye, you know, came up with the concept and because of Joseph Nye that we, we understand the concept and the practice of soft power in certain ways. Uh, but Nye certainly did not invent soft power. Uh, soft power has been used in various guises for centuries and centuries. And China has a long, long history of using soft power. Um, I don't think China invented soft power. Uh, it invented everything else, I think we're told. Um, I remember a couple of years ago China upsetting Scotland by failing the invent golf. Um, but nevertheless, I, I think it does have a very long history of using, uh, practicing, and understanding uh, soft power. Um, and I think Joseph Nye's contribution has been very important to our understanding of soft power, but it's been rather limited. Um, and I think this is partly because he presents a very confusing discussion. I'm not convinced that Joseph Nye knows what soft power is or what he means by soft power. So when I started doing the research for my current project, I was revisiting that whole literature on soft power and public diplomacy. I went back to read Joseph Nye's important 2004 work, Soft Power, The Means to Success in World Politics. And I thought to myself, this is just so confusing. Um, he, he doesn't really understand soft power in any meaningful way, and he's always confusing it with uh, other instruments of international communication like public diplomacy, cultural diplomacy, economic diplomacy, and, and it tends to be that everything becomes 
conflated into this, un under this umbrella term of, of soft power. Um, I think he makes some big contributions to advancing our understanding in his latest book, which is The Future of Power, published last year, and he starts to talk about smart power and the, and the connections between <coughs> soft and hard power. And the other problem I have with, with Joseph Nye's work, as with a lot of work on, on this area, is that it's very American-centric. Um, that it is rooted in a, in a very clear Atlantist uh, uh, perspective. <coughs> um, and he does talk about the conjunction between American and global norms. You know, America setting, setting the scene, setting the store. Uh, for what is going on elsewhere around the world. And of course, I do have very serious problems with that that I'll come on to um, in a moment. And another problem I have with Joseph Nye is that his discussion does tend to be very state-centric. Um, it tends to be rooted in the idea that governments talk and audiences listen. And those of us who are working in public diplomacy now are really talking about new public diplomacy or public diplomacy 2.0. And what this means is, is that we understand public diplomacy and soft power as being much more about a dialogue. It's about listening much more than it has been in the past. And it's about getting other actors involved uh, in, uh, in the activity, getting NGOs, for example, involved, getting uh, you know, forums like this, where you can have that, you know, you can <coughs> reach breach that last three feet of communication, which are always the most important and always the most successful types of communication. Um, and a story I always tell to illustrate this is um, immediately after 9-11, um, you know, um, George Bush, in many of his speeches, you know, was asking, why do they hate us? And those of us who studied public diplomacy were screaming at the television saying, why don't you ask them? You know, and it's that kind of listening activity, it's that kind of engagement with audiences to understand where they're coming from, how your message is getting across, and how your policies are getting across. That's the priority. It has to be how, your, how what you do is perceived abroad more than what you say and how, how what you say is perceived. And I think that this is typical of the kind of problem I have with, with Joseph Nye. Um, where he says, although modernization and American values can be disruptive, they also bring jobs, healthcare, and a range of opportunities. So it's that conflation of, of modernization and American values. You know, if only they, they could be more like us. You know, it, it really harkens back to that 1950s modernization school of thinking, that if only people could be more modern, more American, then the world will be a better uh, and safer place, um, which we know, of course, is, is not the case, and, and oftentimes, America and its allies will go storming into places, not understanding how to win hearts and minds. You know, they want to try and win hearts and minds, but they don't know how to do it. So you get these real cock-ups of, you know, American troops going into a Muslim country and giving Muslim children footballs made of pig leather, you know, which, which you just do not do if you want to win hearts and minds in Muslim countries. So, so this, is, this, is, this, is, this is the crux of one of the problems that I've got is that we are interested in de-westernizing the concept of soft power. And, and I'll say a little bit more about that in, in, a, in a moment. The more I read about soft power, the more I think about soft power, the more I write about soft power, I'm beginning to question the term and think, should I really be using this term of soft power at all? Um, I'm not really sure what it means anymore. Um, it tends to mean everything, you know, that it, it tends to be a catch-all term. And once something means everything, it means nothing. You know, it, it, its value is, is, is diminished rapidly. Um, and also because there's been something of a bandwagon effect. You know, the, the, the explosion of interest in soft power in the last five to ten years has been incredible. It's rather like when I was finishing my PhD uh, at the beginning of the 1990s. At that time, say in 1990, 1991, you know, you would be you'd be hard pushed to go to any seminar in a, in a serious university and listen to uh, seminars about the media and communications and everything else because serious universities don't do this, you know. And then suddenly, after the Gulf War of 1991, 
everybody started thinking, yes, the media are important, and there's the CNN effect, and there's everything else, and suddenly communications programs mushroomed, and, and scholars were all talking about communications and media and their intersection with politics and all other kind of disciplines. And it's, we've seen something of the same effect with soft power, um, not only among scholars, many of whom are not from uh, the discipline and, and have trouble understanding what soft power is themselves, um, but also governments. There's a bandwagon effect among governments. All governments now have to say they do soft power. Otherwise, they're out of step. It's out, they're not being fashionable. They're not, they're not promoting themselves in the, in the correct way. Um, so every day you can find hundreds of media reports uh, by governments who say, you know, this, that, the other is all part of our soft power strategy. And we all just sit there scratching our heads and thinking, well, is it, is it really? You know, do, do you really understand what soft power is? Because you're using it in this catch-all way. I think there's a problem because there's a very ambiguous relationship with other types of power. As I said, it's something that Nye addresses, I think, quite well in, in his latest book, The Future of Power. Where does hard power end and soft power begin? So if you get a military uh, that, is, that is bombing Libya, that's clearly hard power, but then if it drops food and, and, other, and, and aid on the same population, is that soft power, even though it's being done by the military? And it's, it's a very tenuous, very ambiguous relationship, I think, that, that we haven't still got our heads around at, at where these two types of power intersect. So oftentimes, soft power can be seen as something of a panacea for problems in the hard power domain. You know, we don't have to think about what our government is doing, we don't need to think about policies as long as we are doing soft power, as long as we are exporting our films or we are opening institutes to teach the language or whatever it is, you know, that's more important. Um, it, it, it's, 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 it's like the tail wagging the dog, you know, it's, it's like presentation being more important than the policy in many respects. Uh, and it, and it, it reminds me of, of what Phil Taylor, my old colleague, used to say, and, and here's a good sound bite for tweeting, um, you, you can't put lipstick on a pig. Right? You can't put lipstick on a pig. In other words, you, know, you, you, you can't just dress something up and sell it and think that people are going to like it and accept it. You've got to work on the product first. You've got to sell the policy and make sure the policy is right uh, before you can actually sell it. But for all of these problems, um, I do see that I need to continue working in the area. I don't like using the term soft power more and more, but the problem is, is that governments claim to do it. And if I'm going to be a serious scholar of soft power, I have to accept that governments claim they do it and therefore understand why they say they do it and how they say they do it. And whether I agree with their definitions or not, this is what they claim to be. Um, so we need to analyse what they say about soft power, and we need to analyse it and situate it within particular social and cultural contexts. Uh, and this is why I'm interested really in the project of, of de-westernising the idea of soft power, and moving away from that very uh, Anglo-American uh, model of understanding uh, the concept. And finally, I think, I think one of the, the, the other major problems is that there's a tendency uh, within both scholars and practitioners to talk more about outputs than impacts. And what I mean by that is that there's a confusion about how you measure the effects of soft power. And it tends to be simply, you know, how many people have seen a movie, how many viewers does a television service have, how many people listen to the radio as if that is a measure of success. And, and I'll say a little bit more about that in the Chinese context in a moment. Whereas the real measure is, well, what happened as a consequence of people listening to that radio broadcast or reading that newspaper? What's the missing step? You know, we need to understand how, if, if soft power has any meaning, you know, as a way of, of attracting publics to your foreign policy agenda through attraction and values and ideas, then there has to be some modification of those ideas and, that, and behavior or attitudes that you can actually see and measure. And that's where it becomes very difficult, is measuring those, those, those impacts rather than outputs. You know, I, I do have a, a PhD student at the moment uh, who, is, who is looking at um, uh, film as an instrument, the 
movies as an instrument of Chinese soft power. And she's insisting that one way she can, she can measure this is simply by looking at box office receipts. You know, and I keep saying to her, no, you, you can't do this because, okay, somebody bought a ticket to see a Chinese film, but you don't know if they fell asleep in the cinema, you don't know if they walked out halfway, <coughs> you don't know if they go home and think, oh, that was a good film and tomorrow I've got to get the kids up for school and what's for dinner, or whether they actually do say, yes, that was an interesting film, I'm going to read more about China, I'm going to learn Chinese language, etc., etc. So, so looking at these, these outputs rather than impact is, 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 is very, very problematic, I think. So I'm very interested in the idea of, of, of de-Westernization, uh, of moving away from this very Anglo-American model uh, of soft power and public diplomacy. And it's something that my colleague Robin Brown and I at Leeds are, are very keen to do and, and start to, 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 to look at this very seriously. And there has been some good progress made in this area already. Uh, I think these are two of the best books uh, at the moment which do make a significant contribution to this de-Westernization, one on, on East Asian public diplomacy and soft power by uh, Suk John Lee and Jan Mellison uh, Klingendale, uh, but also uh, Ming Jiang Lee's edited book on Chinese soft power, which is, is an excellent book. It, it kind of has a very rich theoretical as well as empirical approach uh, that is, has, has been very significant in, in helping my understanding um, of, of Chinese soft power. So my project on, on de-Westernization is really looking at how soft power uh, and public diplomacy are understood within particular social and cultural contexts. Not how the US approaches it, not so much how Joseph Nye approaches it, but understanding how the Chinese talk about soft power and approach it, or how you know, the Australians or the Africans or whoever it is, understanding within their own cultural understandings uh, of the term. But of course, within my own research on East Asia, and specifically Taiwan and, and, and China, um, I'm interested in whether there is something called soft power or public diplomacy with Chinese characteristics. You know, is, is there something that is unique? How do they understand it? How do they approach it? You know, we, we talk about everything with Chinese characteristics uh, these days. Um, so, so I'm going to get my two pen in there and say, yes, we have to try and think about soft power with Chinese characteristics. Or whether, in fact, they are appropriating models and practices from that Anglo-American tradition, adapting them, using them, you know, how is it being blended together? Um, I think that we are starting to see some results of this de-Westernization uh, in China, um, mainly because those of us working on this in the Anglo-American tradition tend to think about soft power being primarily for international audiences, you know, that it's, it's Britain or America speaking to the world. Whereas for China, what I'm beginning to see is that they also include the domestic constituents in their soft power practices. That they're very much concerned with understanding how soft power can be used within China and talking to Chinese people themselves in order to reinforce you know, the, the ideology, reinforce the idea of economic development, and mobilize opinion, and all of those kind of things. Um, and one of the the major contributions I think that I've taken away from reading the Chinese scholarship on, on soft power has been the idea that it's not so much soft power, but the soft use of power that the Chinese are interested in. There's a difference. You know, it's about using different varieties of power in a soft way, which kind of helps to break down that ambiguity between hard and soft power that, that, I, that I talked about earlier. And finally, I'm, I'm interested in, in how soft power connects with other international communication activities, such as public diplomacy, cultural diplomacy, <coughs> uh, international broadcasting, and in the Chinese context, of course, propaganda, because the Chinese continue to do propaganda. Uh, communist countries do propaganda. It's not a bad thing. Um, I, I believe that propaganda is something that all governments do, and that it's a value-neutral topic. It's a value-neutral practice. Um, that it's, uh, it, it's, it's the intention of the propaganda that determines how we judge the activity of propaganda. Uh, and of course, all communists, all members of communist parties, whether in Russia or wherever, uh, have always been told that propaganda is one of their main uh, functions uh, as party members. I was very disappointed when I went to work 
at the Nottingham campus uh, in, in Ningbo um, because they had this high street with some shops on. And one of the shops there was called the Propaganda Shop. <laughs> and I was running really my hands thinking, great, this is going to be fantastic. And, and all it was really was it was a stationary shop. Uh, I think there was something lost in translation there, um, which, which, which disappointed me hugely. And, and the other thing I should add is that the problem is, is that many people do use these terms as synonyms. <coughs> you know, the soft power, public diplomacy, culture. You know, as if, as if they all refer to the same activity, and they don't. These are very discrete, separate activities. Uh, they all mean different things, and they all have different measures of success. They all have different instruments that they can utilize. Uh, and I think that that is really, really important to understand. Because once you start using these as synonyms, then, then the clarity and the precision are lost, and you tend to go back a step to all those other problems that I, that I highlighted earlier. So as I said, I mean, I mean, China has a long history, I think, of public diplomacy and soft power and using uh, history, using culture, using uh, different methods of attracting foreigners to China and Chinese ideas and Chinese uh, history. Uh, we know about panda diplomacy, of course, uh, which, which, you know, at the moment we've got two pandas at Edinburgh Zoo as part of that uh, public diplomacy, panda diplomacy. We had ping pong diplomacy, of course at the beginning of the 70s, uh, and we had uh, terracotta diplomacy as well, uh, when, when China started lending, uh, exhibiting its, its terracotta warriors uh, around the world, and, and certainly when, uh, when they were loaned to the British Museum a few years ago, you know, terracotta diplomacy was, was all over the media. Um, I also have a picture there of uh, uh, Chiang Kai-shek's wife, uh, uh, Madame Song, um, because she was a very important part of, of, of the nationalist China's public diplomacy uh, in the U.S., very successful. Uh, she was seen as beautiful, she could speak American, sorry, sorry, uh, <laughs> yeah, well, American English, I would say, sorry, yeah, but speak the tongue. She could speak English, she was educated in America, she was all, she was all over Vogue and all over places, and of course her husband was, was Time Magazine Man of the Year on several occasions. You know, there's a huge public diplomacy effort uh, in, in, uh, in, in America uh, during the, the, the 1930s and 1940s. So, so there's been a long history, you know, and, and the panda diplomacy goes back to ancient emperors. They, they, were, they, were, they were also don donating pandas uh, to foreigners uh, way, way, way back in, in, in Chinese history. Um, most recently, of course, we, we had the Beijing Olympics, which is often seen as, as, as the showpiece of, of Chinese uh, soft power, of its public diplomacy. Uh, and I, and I'm, I, I love Anne-Marie Brady's uh, definition of the Olympics, which was a campaign of mass distraction. Uh, we, we, Anne-Marie Brady has done some fan fantastic work on Chinese propaganda, uh, and her book on uh, marketing dictatorship is like my Bible, you know, because it, 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 it does um, outline in great detail the structures of Chinese propaganda, uh, the architecture of, 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 of the institutions and how they work and relate to each other. Um, so, so I'm very grateful to Anne-Marie for, for her work in that area. Now the Beijing Olympics of 2008 were of course billed as, as China's coming out party. Uh, a global and spectacular announcement of uh, China's arrival on the world stage. The opening ceremony, which was staged by, staged by the world famous uh, movie director Zhang Yimou, was a stunning and much celebrated proclamation of China's growing power. A ceremony that combined the historical with a visionary China's glorious past with an equally glorious future. And I want to just quote to you um, an, an, a part of an article that was written for the New Republic in July 2008 by the American Sinologist Andrew Nathan, who described how hosting the Olympics was transforming China from the bottom up and connected these changes to discussions about national image and public diplomacy. And this is what he had to say. Foreign visitors to Beijing will find clean air, smooth traffic, easy internet access, and standardized restaurant menus, all intended to provide them with 17 days of physical, mental, and moral ease. Beijing has trained 1,500 civilized bus riding supervisors, <coughs> appointed 5,000 anti-jaywalking monitors, 
held queuing awareness days, and mounted campaigns against spitting and slurping. And I love this phrase, visitors will see an edited Beijing. I love it, an edited Beijing. The way its governors and many of its residents would like it to be seen, a world capital with its exotic side um, under control. But hosting the Olympics was a, was a huge risk for both the People's Republic of China and the International Olympic Committee, uh, as the latter soon realized when it announced that the, uh, the, the 2008 Games would be held in Beijing. Um, discussion of human rights and democracy soon dominated media coverage, and questions about China's support for questionable activity in Darfur provoked Steven Spielberg to withdraw from the opening ceremony. With the world spotlight focused on Beijing and an estimated 20,000 journalists descending on China to cover the games, the potential for embarrassment was almost palpable. And I remember talking to people in Beijing uh, just before the Olympics and, and saying to them, you know, are you ready for this? Are you ready? Of course we are, we've built a stadium. Now, are you ready for 20,000 journalists coming to China? Because I said they're not going to be, you know, only, only a handful of them are going to be interested in how many medals have been won and what the athletes are doing. Many of them will be taking advantage of the new uh, absence of restrictions and wanting to travel all over China and looking for evidence of human rights abuses and lack of democracy and protests and everything else. Are you ready for this? And, and they confessed that they, they didn't quite know what they were getting into by, by, by giving foreign journalists you know, free roam, uh, freedom to roam um, in China. And what I think one of the main challenges for Chinese public diplomacy at that time derived from the fact that this was the first Olympics of the new media age. Not only would there be journalists in China representing the world's major media organizations <coughs> having to satisfy an insatiable 24-7 demand for live news, but, we'd, but it would also be the first Olympics to be captured on mobile phone cameras, with pictures transmitted instantly around the world, on internet social networking sites by citizen journalists. You know, so the Chinese would find it more difficult than ever to control both the national and the international media and communication spheres. Uh, it, it was often felt that you know, this was a, an example of the world watching China, watching the world watching China. You know, and, and, and any, any, any mistakes, any, anything that caught their eye would immediately be captured on one of these and could be on YouTube or Facebook or whatever within, within a very short time span. So, so it was very difficult to imagine controlling the communication sphere in that kind of spotlight. So that's, that's just a little bit about, about the Olympics because you know, it, it's, it's, it's really the showcase of, of, of Chinese soft power uh, in recent years, and God knows I have a, I must have a dozen MA students every year who are writing about the Olympics and the media and the Olympics and public diplomacy uh, and everything else. Uh, but it did demonstrate that the Chinese are taking very, very seriously their, uh, their attention to, to, to soft power and public diplomacy in the way that China is represented uh, abroad. And it all started to really kick off in around 2004 when there was a division of public diplomacy created within the information department of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, um, with officials saying that China needs to catch up with the development of public diplomacy. So starting to really pay attention to it. They've had this long history of it, and certainly after the events in Tiananmen Square in 1989, they start to think much more seriously about uh, China's national image and the way it's portrayed in the media, um, the need to have spokesmen after SARS and, and, and so forth. But they really start to pay attention to public diplomacy as, a, as an institutional activity in 2004. And we know that now China spends around about 9 billion American dollars per year on soft power activities. Um, and that, that includes everything from the Confucius Institute to CCTV9, etc. Uh, it, it spends, it, it's the highest spender on soft power in Asia. Basically, China spends more than any of anybody else in Asia on its soft power. And there have been some quite significant uh, developments within this realm. Um, I think that one of the most important was the fact that. 
the CCP changed the name of its propaganda department to the publicity department. But only in English. In Chinese, it remains the propaganda department. But nevertheless, by changing it in English, it seems to be a recognition of how audiences overseas perceive their activity and perceive the idea of propaganda. Going back to the idea that propaganda is a pejorative activity. You know, it's what the Nazis did in Germany, it's what ruthless communists like Mao and Stalin did. You know, we want to move away from that. Um, a, 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 a propaganda is a pejorative activity. So they change it in English to give it a nice, softer uh, perception of what they do. But the interesting thing was, and I'm grateful to one of my PhD students for pointing this out to me, is that actually the Chinese did call President Bush's Global Communications Office during the Iraq War the, the, the propaganda office. So, so again, it's that kind of really interesting idea that, that we don't do propaganda anymore, they do it. Mm -hmm. Which is what, exactly what we've been saying for, for decades uh, about communist societies, that we don't do propaganda, it's what those horrible communists do uh, around <coughs> the world. <coughs> but when we're talking about soft power, we're talking much more than simply presentation, as I said, and the message and the instruments. Of, of, how, uh, of how these messages are getting uh, relayed around the world. And this is where I think, I think we do have to pay attention to what Joseph Nye has to say, because Joseph Nye has the idea that soft power is about values, it's about ideals. Right? It's not about messages, it's not simply about, you know, are you exporting a film overseas, oh yes, that's soft power. It's about you know, the, the message that's embedded within those, uh, those discourses. It's about, it's about the values that you are projecting overseas. And ultimately, it's about showing that what you do is more important than what you say. And that the fact that what you do can, can have much more impact and credibility than what you say. So Joseph Nye says that the countries that are likely to be more attractive and gain soft power in the information age are those with multiple channels of communication that help to frame issues. So, you know, having the ability to get your message heard uh, around the world uh, through, through multiple channels. Whose dominant culture and ideas are closer to prevailing global norms, liberalism, pluralism, and autonomy, and that's another reason I have problems with Joseph Nye. You know, who says that these are global norms? You know, it, it's kind of a game making much more urgent that need to, to, to de-westernize the, the, these concepts. You know, the, the idea that, that global norms equals American norms. And he says, and whose credibility is enhanced by their domestic values and policies. So again, as I say, it's, it's what you do and how you treat your own publics that can have an impact on the message and the way that you are perceived overseas. And I just want to touch upon each of these briefly within the Chinese context. Uh, starting with the multiple channels of communication. Uh, and as we know, China has invested heavily in its media, in its international media, and in the, in the outreach uh, of the international media, uh, or the media designed for a non-Chinese audience. So we have CCTV9, CCTV E, CCTV F, the Spanish and French channels. Um, we have CNC now, which is run by, by, by Xinhua. Um, and we have Global Daily, you know, the newspaper. We have the China Daily. Uh, all of these instruments now that China is using to get its message across in English and other languages uh, to, to, to foreign audiences. But my question is always, who is watching? Who is watching these channels? Who are reading the, these newspapers? Um, I always have a bit of an argument with my friends in CCTV. Um, I, I, I loved it. I mean, I, I, I know I get, I, I'm very naughty sometimes when I'm talking to these people. Uh, I do like to provoke them. Uh, and I have a very good friend who is a senior producer. She's really the, the head of, of CCTV E and F. Um, and she helped to, 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 to make some programs a few years ago with Da Shan. And he's communicating Chinese. Uh, she, she was the producer of that program, communicating Chinese. Um, and I went to see her. She, she was a graduate of, of our department uh, at the same time that Mingye and I were both students. And, uh, and we had this discussion over, over, over lunch when I was having probably a little bit too much wine uh, and started to feel a little bit you know, provocative. And we were talking about the number of viewers that CCTV9 and CCTV and F have. 
And of course, they claim they have something like 45, 50, 60 million viewers around the world. And I'm saying, really? Are you sure about that? Because there's a difference, I try to convince them, between viewers and potential viewers. In other words, there may, it might be that, that 45,000 or 50,000 people have access to, a, to, to the channel as part of their cable package in various places around the world. That doesn't mean they're watching it on a regular basis. You know, and trying to get that across to my friends in CCTV is quite difficult because it's, 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 again, it's that, that difference between output and impact. You know, they're, they're simply measuring the numbers. They're, they're looking at the numbers and not thinking about the reality of, of how this translates in practice. Um, and, uh, it, and I do find that the audiences for CCTV9 in particular are quite limited. Um, I think there are three types of audiences for CCTV9. Firstly, there are expatriates in China who have no other English language TV channel to watch, perhaps, uh, and, so, and so watch CCTV9 as much as they can. I think there are people like you and me and other kind of academics and intellectual elites who are interested in China and watch, watch CCTV9 to, to try and see what they're saying and to get news from China. And then I think the biggest audience are the Chinese themselves who want to improve their English. You know, that, that's the biggest audience, I think, for CCTV9. Um, over and above those three audiences, I don't think CCTV9 has much of an audience. Uh, I don't think people are tuning in in their millions all around the world. Uh, and I had an interview with, a, with a, uh, an American journalist uh, a few weeks ago um, who were very concerned about CCTV9 and CNC making inroads into, uh, into America and, and you know, starting to, to be affiliated with local channels. You know, Professor Ormsley, isn't this just propaganda? Isn't this Chinese propaganda? I said, you know, don't worry about it. Do not worry yeah. about it. Because the, you know, may, maybe some people will watch it at first for novelty. Oh, good. No, I don't. That's interesting. I can now watch the news from China. I said. But I said that the same number of people won't be watching CNC that don't watch CCTV9. So, so, so don't worry about it. You know, the, the, and there'll always be that suspicion about propaganda. You know, there's always that suspicion that, that these are government-owned stations and therefore the credibility is, uh, is, is, is not to be trusted. You know? And credibility is all important. Credibility is the lifeblood of international communications, public diplomacy and propaganda. Uh, and again, like my old colleague Phil Taylor said, once you lose, um, what is it? What's the quotation? Your, your credibility is like virginity. Once you've lost it, you can't get it back. Right. So, so credibility is extremely, extremely important. Uh, and China's international media have problems with their credibility, I think, because they're state-owned. So naturally, everybody's suspicious of what they're doing and what they're saying. Rightly or wrongly, that's the perception. And there is a wonderful quote, uh, a joke, that the only thing you can trust about the People's Daily is the date. You know, and, 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 and I heard that quite a lot, even by the, my Chinese friends when I, when I lived in China uh, as well. So credibility is, is, is extremely, extremely important. Moving on to the second point of, uh, of a nice framework, which is that you know, it has to be consistent with prevailing global norms, liberalism, pluralism, and autonomy. Well, as I said, who decides that these are global norms? You know, who gets to say what are global norms and what aren't? Um, that's a major problem, and I think that this, is, this, this makes it more urgent to think about de-Westernization, to think about how governments like China think about soft power within their own cultural uh, contexts. And we do know, however, that you know, a political system like China, which many claim now to be neo-authoritarian, does have difficulty in selling its values. You know, what, what kind of values is it selling? Uh, and can it make its ambitions, its soft power ambitions, consistent with the reality of life for many in China uh, and, and, and elsewhere? So the question becomes, is China soft power? Is its soft power credibility enhanced by domestic values and policies? You know, you know, you, 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 can, you, can, you can have a very successful soft power drive and soft power strategy, 
but it only takes news about, you know, famous artists like Ai Weiwei being imprisoned, or Liu Xiaobo being denied the Nobel Prize, or, you know, uh, the Chinese trying to bury a train after it crashes, you know, to try and hide it. All of these kind of things, all of these stories come out and undermine the credibility, undermine all the good work that has been done uh, in, in soft power terms. Um, because that's what the news seizes on. The news seizes on bad news. It likes to find bad news to, to report in the Western context. And this is why I think that it's, it's useful to talk about the soft use of power. Um, I won't read out the whole of this quotation. I'll let, I'll let you, you read it while I talk. Um, but basically what it's saying is, is that the way that power is used on, its, on, on your own people, the government's power is used on its own people, can have an influence on the way that that government is perceived abroad. You know, and the, the way that you exercise authority in your own country has an, can resonate around the international arena. Uh, because foreign observers see how you are behaving, they're seeing how you treat your own people, and then make assumptions and connections with what <coughs> is happening in the international arena. So, uh, so this is a very interesting quotation that extends that a little bit further. The critical question is not how popular China has become in certain parts of the world, but how much China's improved image has increased the trust of the international community in China's growing power and the moral authority and legitimacy of China's domestic and international policies. The evidence in this regard is at best patchy. In other words, it's not a popularity contest. Right? Soft power is not simply about who's popular and who isn't. It's about achieving your ambitions, achieving goals, and being attracted to the moral values, ideas, ideals that your country represents. And only when you can move away from outputs to impact and demonstrate that attitudes and behaviours and opinions have changed can you therefore say that there is some measurable uh, soft power impact. And I think in this regard, what has been happening to China's image is very, very interesting uh, from, a, from a soft power perspective. Because there's been a, a World Service, BBC World Service poll in, in, in 22 countries, which was really talking about the power of the, the image of China. And you can see here that in 2005, 48% of respondents were very positive about China, 30% were negative. In Asian countries, that was 53% positive. Last year, 2011, in the most recent survey, positive image has gone down overall across the world and has gone down significantly in Asia. Quite a remarkable change there in the number of people who are set, talking in a positive way about China. And the, the negative uh, has, has increased quite substantially. Uh, and this is data that is replicated uh, in other leading polls uh, done by, by some of the world's best polling organizations. So the question becomes, you know, if China is spending so much money and developing so many resources to soft power, why is the image going down and not going up? There's, there's, there should be a positive correlation, and there isn't. And it's a really interesting question, therefore, to think about, are there other reasons? You know, is it the hard power domain? Is it national values, and is it domestic treatment of, 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 of their own population and everything else that causes this natural image of China to fall despite this titanic expansion in soft power terms. So the question becomes, is there actually a credibility gap? Is, is it because there's an inconsistency between what China says and what it does, how it behaves, and how, it, you know, and the message that it is transmitting around the world. Is it the fact that there is now an overcrowded, soft power marketplace, perhaps, that everybody is competing in terms of image and ideas and ideals and everything else, and therefore the the numbers are bound to fluctuate because of that competition? I don't know the answer, but it's an interesting question that we need to ponder. One of the things that that people often pay attention to when they're looking at this is, is the so-called China model, you know, the export of, of the economic model uh, around the world. And, and again, this is something that is quite unique to China, 
uh, because other countries don't really talk about the export of their economic models in quite the same way uh, as China does. Um, and there's been a lot of a lot of discussion about the fact that you know people are attracted to China through soft power because of, of, of the export of its economic model. Whereas there's been a lot of scepticism as well. Uh, a country's economic clout reinforces its soft power if others are attracted to it for reasons beyond trade, market access, or job opportunities. In other words, if you are attracted to China simply because it's a huge market and there are investment opportunities there, that's not soft power working. That's business. That's economics. That's finance. Because you can do business with China but still be very critical of its government, be critical of its policies and ideas and ideals and morals and everything else. But business is business and profit is profit. So what we're actually seeing is quite a reactive soft power strategy, I think, quite a defensive soft power strategy developed by China. Um, it really developed, as I say, in the wake of Tiananmen Square in 89 as a, as a reaction to SARS, uh, in 2003 and 2004, uh, but it also developed as a rejoinder to Japanese and Korean waves uh, and as a, uh, and concerns about American cultural hegemony. Um, you know, we, we, all, we all know about, about the way that the culture is now flowing in multiple directions around Asia, with Korean wave and Japanese wave and everything else, and sometimes it's very difficult to, to know the origins of these. Um, but nevertheless, we do know that, that there was a lot of concern that China has to be in the game. It has to be part of this. And it has to be making sure that its voice is heard as much as Japan and South Korea and Hong Kong and other areas. And uh, uh, Zhao Qijun, who was the former director of the State Council Information Office, who was responsible really for uh, getting China's uh, message uh, disseminated abroad, said that soft power was needed because of the demonization of China by the Western media. There's always this conspiracy theory that the Western media don't understand China, they're out to get China, and they're going to demonize China. Uh, and then China must represent an accurate picture of itself to the world. Right. So, so it's a very reactive and defensive strategy. But my question becomes, is there proof of a conspiracy against uh, China by the Western media? Um, I'm very sceptical of this. I'm very sceptical. And I know that certainly, you know, at the, at the time of the, uh, just before the, the Olympics in 2008, when there were the, the, the <coughs> pro-Tibet pro -Tibet protests. Is that right? Pro-Tibet, yes. Pro-Tibet, don't say that when you're drunk. Pro-Tibet mm -hmm. protests um, in the run-up to the Olympics. Um, there was a huge outpouring of nationalist sentiment, which was saying basically boycott, you know, carry for, and boycott CNN, and every, all the Western media are against China and everything else. And even my students were doing this. Um, I was in Australia at the time as a, as a visiting fellow in Sydney, and I, I was sitting getting my emails. And even my students, my, my, my Chinese students, were writing to each other and, and me because I was part of their discussion group, talking about, you know, the demonization of China by the Western media and everything else. And I had to write back and say, wait a minute, you are communication students. Haven't you learned anything? Haven't I taught you anything in the time that you've been in the UK? Because what I think we're actually seeing is not so much deliberate demonization of China by the Western media, it's actually differences in professional news values and approaches to journalism and understandings of what news is and the expectations of news audiences. So the fact that, you know, Certainly in Britain and America and other places, news is often bad news. We like to be critical. We like to be critical of our government and other governments. You know, and, and news is bad news. Whereas the Chinese often have a difficulty understanding that because news is good news. It's, it's lots of men in suits clapping each other and opening <laughs> factories. You know, it, it's about the, the, the modernization of China. It's about the economic development and the success and everything else. It's different news values. And I think there's a misunderstanding that, that, that because there is bad news about China, that it's actually a deliberate policy to demonize China. And actually, there, there, there's not much proof of this in the literature. And there's actually evidence for the fact that you know, there is a balance, that there's still a lot of good news, very positive news about China in the Western, and the British, and the American media. 
And this is all part of what Joseph Nye called meta soft power. And it's the capacity to accept criticism and self criticism. You know, if China wants to be accepted as a major world player, as an international figure, I think it has to accept that criticism comes with the territory. You know, in the same way that we criticize the American government, we criticize our own government in Britain or whatever. China has to expect criticism. And it's best to accept it and understand it and accept it as part of being a responsible world player than simply retreating in on itself and becoming very nationalist and saying foreigners don't understand China and the media are all against China or whatever. I think, I think being able to accept criticism is one of the major sources of, of soft power. Finally, I just want to say a little bit about culture because there is always this big emphasis on, on culture as a, as a method of soft power and public diplomacy and, 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 and showing how cultural products can resonate with audiences and public opinion around the world. But I, I often think that this emphasis on culture is misleading. And I talked last night specifically about Taiwan because Taiwan is pushing culture as its main uh, public diplomacy theme. And I, and I think that is a huge mistake for Taiwan. But anyway, that, that was last night, this is this night. Um, first of all, I'm always interested to know how you translate intangibles into tangibles. You know, how do you make that next step? How do you make sure that your cultural product is having an effect? Culture is something that's an intangible product. How do you translate that then into a product that you can measure, into showing that there has been a change of opinion or attitude or behavior? It's very, very difficult to measure cultural influence. Um, and I always use the example of Yao Ming uh, when, when I talk about this. Um, you know, when I was in Taiwan last year uh, watching CNN, CNN uh, announced the retirement of Yao Ming uh, from professional basketball. And CNN made this claim that uh, Yao Ming is China's greatest soft power asset. And I was screaming, pulling back, no, please don't say this, because it's not. Yao Ming is a very, very good basketball player. But, but to be a soft power asset, what you have to prove is that people become interested in China, learn the language, become, become supportive of China, or their attitudes change about China, because they've watched Yao Ming play basketball. Now, it might be that they do. It might be that you get a 14-year-old kid who goes to watch Yao Ming play with the Houston Rockets, and then thinks, wow, this guy's a representative of China. I want to learn Chinese language, and I'm going to read about Chinese history and everything else. Or it might be that 14-year-old kid thinks, wow, that tall guy is really a good basketball player, and then goes home and you know thinks about his homework or watches TV or whatever, and doesn't give China another thought. So I am very skeptical of, of, of these claims about Yao Ming and other cultural products being, uh, being useful soft power um, assets. But the main reason is the subjectivity of cultural products. You know, the way that we all internalize and indigenize messages in unique ways. Um, and Joseph Knight says that outcomes are more in control of the subject than is often the case with the hard power. In other words, we as receivers have the power. The governments or the, 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 the producers of these cultural commodities put, them, put their products out there but they have no idea how we're going to receive it, how we're going to see the product. You know, we can watch a Chinese film and think, wow, yeah, that's telling me a lot about China, that's changed my position, or we might just think that's a good Chinese film, or it's a bad Chinese film, or whatever. They have no understanding of how we are going to react, because it's so subjective. And there's been a lot of research on this over the years. I mean, there's been a lot of good research on Dallas, for example, the, the 1980s American soap opera, where they show, show the same uh, editions of the program, same episodes, to audiences in different parts of the world and see how they react. And they react in very, very different ways. You know, I remember reading that, that Dallas, I don't know if you know Dallas at all, am I talking? Dallas was a 1980s American soap opera which was about very, very rich families, in oil producing families. And it was all about, you know, who's backstabbing whom and who's shooting whom and who's sleeping with whose wife and sister and everything else. It was a huge success all around the world. Now, they showed this program in communist Russia, <laughs> right? 
Now, we all thought, wow, okay, this isn't going to translate communist Russia, capitalist America, and everything else. But it was a huge success because it was claimed, look, this is an example of how bad capitalists work. Mm -hmm. This is their lifestyle. You know, this is what we want to try and avoid. So it was successful for that reason. They showed the same product, Dallas, in Mexico, where it had completely different reaction. Wow, this is aspirational. This is what we want to be like. We want to be like the rich Americans and have this glamorous lifestyle. It's the same product, but being internalized in different ways. And that's another reason why I have, I have problems with understanding how culture can translate into being a soft power uh, asset. And the final thing, of course, is, is whose culture are we talking about? Who gets to decide the culture? Whose culture is it that dominates uh, the, these discourses? So I think that culture is, is, is part of an overall strategy. It shouldn't dominate the strategy, as it's doing, in, uh, as I said last night, in Taiwan uh, at the moment. But it has an important role to play, um, but can achieve very little. I'm, I'm, I'm reminded of, 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 a, of a film that was shown in New York a couple of months ago as part of China Cultural Movie Week. And it was a film called The Founding of the Republic. How many people went to the premiere in New York? Nobody. It didn't have one single audience member. And not even anybody <coughs> from the hosting organization went. You know, it, it was an absolute failure. Right? But then on the way back from Taiwan, I watched a fantastic Chinese movie called Love for Life. Uh, what's the Chinese? I keep forgetting the Chinese. It's Wei Ai. Oh, it's Wei Ai. It's Wei Ai. It's about AIDS in China. It's about a village. Zhang Zi Ying, and they, they have AIDS in, in this village. I thought that was a wonderful movie, and I thought that had far more soft power capacity than Founding of the Republic. Because it doesn't have a political agenda, it's quite critical, and it addresses taboo issues, you know, sensitive taboo issues in China. And for me, that, that has more soft power capacity, because I think, wow, China's progressing, China's improving, its movie industry is improving, and the fact that it's able to address these taboo issues and these sensitive issues tells me something about China's progress. So, so that, that's just a, a, an anecdote to show you where I am with, with cultural so let me just wrap up by, by giving you a few of my, my conclusions. Uh, and, and with permission, I'll, I'll, I'll read this. While it is possible to argue that China's projection of culture is meeting some limited success, the principal dilemma for soft power is the disjuncture between its aspirations and the external perceptions of its actions, at home and abroad. On the one hand, China yearns to be part of an interdependent world and to spread the benefits of political, economic, and cultural engagement with China. On the other hand, Chinese political discourse is often characterized by a fierce nationalist rhetoric that is reinforced by the Communist Party's determination to maintain authoritarian rule. Together with China's apparent unconditional friendship of regimes with questionable human rights records and the use of military threats against Tibet and Taiwan, such actions undermine the idea that Chinese soft power is about selling national and cultural values. In other words, if the Chinese wish to approach its outreach through the soft use of power, it may have to address the credibility gap between what it says and what it does. In the domain of international communications, one of the greatest challenges is converting the intangible attributes of soft power into tangible and measurable outcomes. How does soft power connect with one's foreign policy objectives? As Joseph Knight has observed, whether the possession of soft power resources actually produces favorable outcomes depends on the context and skill of the agent in converting the resources into behavioral outcomes. China has created a reactive and somewhat defensive soft power strategy. The PRC developed its interest in soft power because of the country's supposed demonization by Western media and the so-called China threat discourses of the 1990s. It is clear from examining both the discourse and practice of soft power that China has adopted and adapted the original Western ideas. And while we may criticize the emphasis on promoting Chinese culture, however it may be defined, this may be the first step in recognizing a distinctly Chinese <coughs> style of soft power and public diplomacy 
that will help us to further understand their de-westernisation. And I think I've talked far too much, so I will, I will finish there. I'd love any questions and comments.